Tomorrow, our daughter Ada turns six months old. I know, right? Where does the time go? And one of the things that means is that this week at her pediatric appointment, she'll be able to get her COVID vaccine. Yeah. We've been looking forward to that for a long time. Steph and I have been really careful, extra careful when it comes to masking and social distancing and all that because uh, we do not want to bring that home to our daughter, our tiny five weeks premature daughter. I can still see her in that first day in the NICU with the giant CPAP machine on her little face. And that makes me all the more cautious about COVID. But as we now come up to this long awaited appointment and vaccination, I find myself getting nervous for her too. Because I've had the COVID vaccine and I've had boosters, I've had all kinds of shots. And I know that some of those really took me for a ride. And I worry about what it's going to be like for her. It's hard enough, if you, you, some of you know what I'm talking about, it's hard enough watching the nurse stick that little needle in her little thighs and just that, like, what's happening look. That's hard enough. But to think about, like, maybe having to deal with a fever and everything when she's never even been sick before, like, I know she's going to be fine, but it makes me worry a little bit, right? Isn't it interesting how we can both anxiously await something and worry about it at the same time. It seems like a contradiction at first, doesn't it? But then you realize we do it all the time. Big exams, surgeries, your wedding day, or it is vaccination. We like to label things as either good or bad, but when you get right down to it, a lot of things are a little bit of both, aren't they? Take the day of the Lord, for instance. That enigmatic and threatening time that the prophet Malachi writes about. Malachi writes about. The day that comes burning like an oven. A few verses later, he's going to say, the great and terrible day of the Lord. And so we're left kind of wondering, well, which is it? Is it great or terrible? Uh, the first part of this reading today sounds pretty terrible, right? People burnt like stubble in the fields. But the next part sounds pretty great. The sun of righteousness rising with healing in its wings. But it's hard not to read these texts and come away a little bit terrified, no matter what Jesus says. As I ponder these texts today, I start to wonder what it is that makes us so naturally and automatically terrified of these things. So for one thing, there's all the destruction and devastation that's being talked about, right? It speaks of violence and upheaval and uncertainty. But as I dig a little deeper, I notice that what I observe makes people the most uncomfortable when we talk about these readings about the day of the Lord is judgment. We hear it in Malachi, right? The arrogant and all evildoers will be burned like stubble. Neither root nor branch will be left to them. There are some folks in our, in the, in our beloved church who take that and run with it, and they are quick to make pronouncements about who is going to be punished and how based on what the Bible says, right? I find it's precisely that kind of interpretation that tends to make Lutherans a little antsy around texts like this. Because if we're all sinners, doesn't all evildoers include us too? Maybe we'd rather not talk about judgment at all. Let's just leave it over there and stick with the text about God's mercy. The God we worship is loving. Right? And merciful, not judgmental. But the question today, can God really be loving if God isn't also judgmental? I think back to my daughter's vaccination. The way this COVID vaccine works is that it tricks one's body's own cells into manufacturing the proteins that cover the surface of that COVID coronavirus, right? It does this so that our bodies can start recognizing those proteins and identifying them as a threat and start attacking them and providing an immune response. In other words, what this vaccine does is it teaches our bodies to judge what is benign from what is harmful. The fever and the aches and the fatigue that I hope that Ada doesn't experience is actually kind of the response we're hoping to see, isn't it? It's the body mobilizing its defenses against something that shouldn't be there. 
I think we might have such a strong reaction against the word judge because at least in the context of the Bible, we've been reading it so long as a juridical process, right? We read it as God writing these laws about what is right and wrong and then punishing those who break them and rewarding those who follow them. It's all very arbitrary. But what if, instead of uh, a courtroom, we saw God's judgment and the coming day of the Lord as an immune response? A way of identifying and eradicating what is harmful to human flourishing while protecting what's beneficial. Upon closer inspection, I notice that that very idea is right there in Malachi's words today. That day, he says, comes burning like an oven. I've seen days like that, have you? Where you go outside and you just feel like you could fry an egg on the sidewalk. It feels like walking into an oven. You know what makes those days so hot? The sun. The sun rising high in the sky, beating down on everything. The same sun that Malachi uses as an image of healing and wholeness in his vision. The folks in the Bible study this week noticed how, this, how Malachi's words seem to switch tone abruptly from threatening to reassuring. And I notice if we keep reading another verse or two, it switches back. And it makes me wonder, what if Malachi doesn't see that as a switch at all? What if it's all the same thought? What if the threat and the promise are one and the same? What if the sun of righteousness is the heating element in that burning oven? What if that heat is the fever of the body attacking what shouldn't be there? Can God's healing also be kind of terrifying? Like I said, at first that seems a little contradictory, even absurd, until you start to realize that it's no different from our lived experience every day. We long for the day of the Lord, don't we? For God's coming kingdom, for that peace and wholeness and justice promised in the scriptures. Because we all recognize that there's something that's fundamentally wrong with the world as it is. Nations rise against nations. Famines and plagues devastate human life, often exacerbated by other human factors like greed or environmental destruction. Nations and communities and even families are divided against one another, brimming with hatred that sometimes even brings death. And yet that's the world that we are terrified of losing. Jesus' images of toppled buildings and unsteady ground and hostile social structures terrify us because they represent the loss of everything we know and hold dear, even if what we know and hold dear is broken. We've come to rely upon, and in some cases, even love the very things that are making us sick. And that pulls us away from God and the life that God intends for us. I noticed that the entire story from Luke today takes place in front of the temple. God's house, the center of worship, right? The temple represents not just the physical building, but the entire religious institution and the theology of Jesus' community. It's an institution that is both harmful and helpful. Not only does it mediate God's, people, God's people's relationship with God, it also codifies the misconceptions and the prejudices that keep them from knowing God more fully. As such, its destruction is a tragedy, but also a liberation. Its destruction is the fever as God works the world toward health. And I cannot read about the temple in this context without also thinking about the church. One day, the church as we know it will be destroyed too. Not one stone will be left on another. In fact, these days, in the midst of declining attendance and anti-institutional sentiment in the culture, that ending is looking a little bit closer, right? And that causes church people to fret, to be terrified. But I wonder, should we be? 
That very temple that Jesus talked about was destroyed. And yet the Jewish people remain. Changed, yes, but enduring. One might even say that enduring that catastrophe, they grew as a people and as a community. They grew in their understanding of how they fit into God's story. They gained their soul, so to speak, just as Christians did in the devastating and heartbreaking loss of their own Jewish communities of support. As terrifying and painful and regrettable as these events were, they became for Jews and Christians alike opportunities to testify, to walk with God and to tell one another the story of who they were and who they were becoming in God. Each of these communities came through a day of the Lord and emerged having been both scorched and healed, having died and been resurrected. And so I, I wonder then if we might be able to hear Jesus say, do not be terrified, and maybe, just maybe, begin to see in all the terrible things around us, things like wars and insurrections, famines and pandemic, climate change, contentious elections and eroding trust in democratic processes, even in polarization and violence, if we might see in those things the day of the Lord. Maybe in addition to being terrifying, these things can also be a sign of hope. Hope that God is still helping us to judge what is killing us and to resist those things. Hope that like a fever, our struggles are evidence of something benevolent at work among us, driving out what might otherwise destroy us. These things may not in themselves be good, but by enduring them in the way of Jesus with love and mercy, perhaps our world may yet gain its soul. So maybe then our invitation as Christians is to, in Paul's words, not grow weary in doing what is right, even when it is so wearisome so often. Maybe our call is to testify to what God is still doing in Christ. To renounce the ways of the world that draw us from God and to instead live into our baptismal vocation to proclaim the good news in word and deed and to strive together for peace and justice in all the earth. Maybe this is the moment for which we have been called. Maybe this is the day of the Lord. Maybe this is our opportunity to be a vaccine for, the, for a sick but salvageable world, helping it to recognize and judge what is killing it and offer something else, something new, something life-giving. Maybe as frightening as all of these things sometimes are, this is also the dawning of the sun of righteousness rising with a healing fever in its wings. After all, if God can transform our lynching of God's own Son into the very means of our forgiveness, cannot God also transform these things that terrify us? <laughs>